And, uh, and then you have to choose. You can choose your whole desktop or you can choose the actual screen, which, which is, I think, what you chose, which is good. Right. Let me just move over to my slides. Go into full view. Okay. So uh, if y'all are ready, I'll get started. Sure. Okay, so for my uh, thesis, I did a project and um, that was creating a browser extension to improve PubMed record full text linking. And um, just a little background on what got me started on this. Um, I'm a, the digital and technical services librarian at the SUNY College of Optometry. And uh, I was noticing that I would get a lot of uh, complaints from our users about um, getting full text articles from PubMed. And just a little PubMed background in case um, anyone isn't uh, aware of PubMed. It's a, a giant public database that uh, indexes records to medical literature. And uh, it actually does uh, have linking services that provide uh, full text article linking to libraries holdings. So uh, the fact that um, so many of our users can't quite seem to figure out how that works made me realize there's a disconnect in how PubMed's linking works and how that's incorporated into their interface and how our users are expecting to search and retrieve articles. So I thought about solutions for a while. Uh, we, we, do, we do instruct our users at the beginning of every semester on how to use PubMed and that does include uh, how to get to full text articles from PubMed, but um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, people just it kind of forget uh, how to do that because it, it's kind of complicated. So um, I, the, the problem is really uh, not so much in the instruction, but just in PubMed's interface itself. And unfortunately, we don't have control over their interface. So um, I thought that creating a browser extension uh, that would provide a way to modify PubMed's interface um, when it's not sufficient. So had a couple research questions and the primary question is how could a browser extension solve the problem students are having connecting to SUNY Optometry's collection of full text records from PubMed? And before I answered that primary question, I uh, kind of had to answer some secondary questions and those are what are the main objectives of information seekers in their search process and what are common obstacles in this process? In what ways are PubMed's two linking services, known as Linkout and Outside Tool, not meeting user information seeking needs? And how does Google Scholar compare to PubMed in fulfilling user information seeking needs? And I mentioned Google Scholar because uh, that and PubMed are probably the most heavily used outside search tools uh, at our institution. And I don't get nearly as many complaints about Google Scholar as I do PubMed. So I wanted to see what's Google Scholar doing right, what's PubMed doing wrong, and uh, maybe how could I apply some of what Google Scholar does right to uh, my browser extension with PubMed. So uh, my lit review helped me answer a lot of these secondary questions. And the main thing that hit me when seeing how users search was the notion of cognitive load. And cognitive load theory essentially states that a person has a limited amount of mental resources available for solving problems in a given amount of time. Um, it identifies uh, limited attention and working memory capacity as specific bottlenecks that uh, continually exert load during human information processing. Uh, this theory is, has been applied to human-centered design and it stresses the importance of minimizing extraneous cognitive load that users experience due to an interface by removing distractions. So circling back to uh, information seeking behavior of users, um, users not only prefer, but have come to expect quick and seamless access to full text articles. Uh, any obstacles that get in the way of their search path to retrieve the articles or distractions from that search path significantly increases uh, the cognitive load. So the more obstacles they are in that path, the, more, the greater the cognitive load is. And uh, this leads to frustration, possibly users abandoning their search, and doesn't really engender a lot of trust in the system, in this case, PubMed. So um, just to sum it up, when doing research, you, the user is focused on engaging with and evaluating the content itself, not the delivery system for that content, which is the interface. 
So with all this in mind, I uh, wanted to take a critical look at PubMed's linking services, how they're incorporated into uh, PubMed's interface, and then essentially make a list of these uh, distractions, obstacles, et cetera, anything that adds to the user's cognitive load, and then create a browser extension that modifies the interface in a way that removes those obstacles. So as I kind of uh, mentioned before, the ideal search path has as few steps as possible. Uh, this will minimize the cognitive load and provide a good user experience. Ideally, um, user will perform a search for a known item or subject, evaluate those results, and then once they identify the record they want, they'll, move, they'll be able to move to the full text uh, seamlessly. So um, what I have here is a screenshot of a PubMed record and then uh, the full text article that that leads out to. And uh, this is uh, an example of PubMed, one of PubMed's linking services, Linkout. And what Linkout is, is um, what happens is a user will register with PubMed, provide all of their holdings information, and will also upload an icon that's meant to indicate full text access to the article. And then what PubMed does is provide that institution with a URL that's unique and specific to that institution and users are meant to only access PubMed through that URL. And that's how, um, when they're doing their search, the institution's icon that indicates, indicates full text access will pop up when uh, they are entitled to that access. So already, when Linkout is working as it's meant to, you're already adding a few more steps than uh, most users are used to when uh, doing a lot of uh, database searching. Um, the having to remember to go to a specific URL just does, does not happen, no matter how many times you tell them, tell them to book, bookmark it, it, it's just, it's not realistic. Um, so even if a user is doing everything right, they have to remember to go to the library specific URL to access PubMed, then they'll do their search, and then hopefully look for um, that icon that indicates full text access. And if you look at the very bottom of this record that I provided a screenshot of, you, you see a, a tiny, tiny, tiny square, and that is the icon. Uh, so that's not a very uh, effective icon, and that is because PubMed has really strict specifications for uh, the size of icons. So that's another obstacle. Also, uh, the view that we're looking at of this record is what's called abstract view, and this is not the default view. So when a user does a search, they'll just see um, the title of the article, and they won't even see uh, that icon, so they don't even know if uh, they can indeed link out to the full text article. So again, even if uh, a user does everything right, there's still many um, steps that get in their way that they have to think about that is uh, distracting. And um, there, <laughs> in addition to the above, there are, are more variables that uh, could happen in Linkout that add several obstacles in the user search process. Um, not every publisher participates in Linkout. So if the library does have access to an article, but the publisher does not participate in Linkout, the library icon will not appear. And the user has no way of knowing what's going on. Um, similarly, if uh, the library just doesn't have access to that article, again, the icon doesn't appear, which um, makes sense at first, but the fact that there's no way to link out to the library's document delivery or interlibrary loan system uh, is providing the user with a wall. So again, the user could be doing everything right. They might remember to use the library specific URL. They might remember to click to abstract view so they can see that library icon, and then they see no icon, don't know what's going on, they will have to go to their library's homepage, from there go to their library's interlibrary loan page, log in from their ILL home, fill out the ILL form, toggling back and forth between the PubMed record and the form to enter all their citation information, and then submit that request only to possibly be told the, the next day that the library actually had full text access to that all along. So it's no user, no user. It's no wonder that our users get, um, get frustrated. And uh, this is a, um, a screenshot of um, Outside Tool, which is the other linking service uh, that PubMed uses. It's very similar to Linkout. Um, it, the only difference is that in this case, the library provides PubMed with, um, they register their link resolver and uh, 
link resolvers are what libraries use uh, with pretty much all their subscription databases to connect to their full text holdings. So outside tool is an improvement on link out in that um, the library icon appears on every record. But so they're, they're not going to be hitting that that roadblock before uh, they can connect to their ILL system directly from there. And it doesn't matter whether a publisher participates. But the problem with a uh, outside tool is that in addition to the library icon appearing on um, every record, a bunch of other links also <laughs> end up appearing to uh, different publisher platforms. And uh, this can be confusing for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, if uh, the library doesn't subscribe to that, partic that particular uh, publisher platform, the user's gonna hit a paywall. Uh, even if the library does subscribe, uh, if they're not on campus, uh, they won't be able to authenticate. So again, <laughs> they'll hit a paywall again. The other uh, problem is, as you can see in this record, this is a, the full record view. There are a lot of different uh, possibilities for the user to click. Uh, on the top right hand side, you see that full text links area up here. So you have this one icon that says view full text and then our little library icon. But then if you look down at the bottom of the record, you see more links that say, you know, link out more resources, full text sources with the link libraries that says link out holdings with a link. So it's just really confusing. Um, Hicks law states the time it takes to make a decision increases as the number of alternatives increases. So you don't want to be providing users with all these possible things to click because um, that's going to take more time and be distracting. And particularly when only one of these links actually clicks out to what they want. Uh, you want to only <laughs> provide that link. <clears throat> so to sum it up, uh, there should really just be one link to the content. And uh, that link ideally should be in a consistent location that's uh, a lot right there with the, the rest of the main content. And the, the link out or the icon that links out should be big and clear and make sense to the user. So I kind of now have a, had a big list of uh, distractions and obstacles and all these things that add to the cognitive load of the user and create a lot of frustration. Before I started uh, designing the extension, I thought it would be a good idea to take a look at Google Scholar's interface. And in comparison with PubMed, it's clear and users can connect to their library's holdings uh, once they set up library links. And library links is a service that Google Scholar offers where an institution can register their link resolver much like they do with PubMed's outside tool. Uh, the difference, however, is that um, once uh, the, the institution sets up uh, their library links, the user then in their browser uh, can go into their settings and search for their library, uh, just click a check mark next to their library, and then every time that they go into Google Scholar on that browser, they'll see that li these library links on the right-hand side that connect with the library's link resolver. And uh, that kind of a, what I call a set it and forget it solution is so much better <laughs> than having to get a um, library-specific URL that they have to remember to find and click on every time. This, they don't have to think about, they'll just always see their library links after they set it up. And um, again, uh, the interface is a lot more clear. You just see uh, these see it at SUNY optometry links, so you know what to click. So I identified all of the elements that were extraneous or confusing on um, the PubMed interface. And to actually write the, the script for the extension, I had to go into developer tools in the browser and that allowed me to identify the exact elements in the code um, on, on the DOM that I wanted to modify. So on the screenshot on the left, I uh, highlighted this uh, full text links here because that uh, is off to the side and it's confusing because there are a lot of different buttons. So I could find the idea of that in the code and then just uh, go over to the console in the next tab over in developer tools and just write one line of jQuery to target that to remove it. And uh, that's what this is here. You can see those library links are no longer there. So uh, that was how I started um, 
writing my script, I just went through line by line with um, uh, each, each obstacle that I identified and uh, would write a line of code, jQuery, to uh, remove it. So I removed all the extraneous elements and then um, had to write the code to insert uh, one big clear button uh, that would be consistent on every page. So after I um, went through line by line writing the code to do that, I put all the lines together to uh, make my script in Sublime Text. And um, so this is, this is the, the code, the actual, the actual script here. And again, it's a really, really short script. It's just a few, a few lines. And as you can see the first few lines, just um, target and remove the uh, extraneous elements that uh, were confusing that I identified. And then this part of the code, the bottom part of the code, um, is uh, the, the code that inserts the button. And um, that was a little more complicated in that uh, I wanted the button to appear on every record um, in every view. And so to do that, I had to figure out the linking syntax that our link resolver uses. And so I did that and stored that in a URL. And at the end of um, the links, there's something called a PubMed ID number. And that's a unique identifier that gets applied to every PubMed record. And um, so that would be how I would link to each specific article. So what I had to do was find a way to grab each individual um, PubMed ID number and uh, then create a new variable full address because that would be linking out for each record. So I uh, found where the PubMed ID was in the code and it's in a DD element here. And so I grabbed that HTML um, and that's a, it's in the DD element for every uh, one of these aux ID divs. So I would grab that for each one, make a full address and then um, append that full address to the bottom of the main content there. And um, I also, uh, the full address I put in a, a big button that I designed. So that's what that image is. So once I tested the script, um, I had to figure out how to make that a browser extension. And um, uh, I decided to do the extension in Chrome because it's just a heavily used uh, web browser. And they also provide pretty good documentation. So, to do that, um, I needed to create a manifest.json file. And um, that is pretty much telling the browser uh, how to execute and when to execute the, the, the JavaScript file. So in the content script here, it's just saying um, when the URL matches this, so when a user's on PubMed, execute first this script, which is, uh, that's just uh, jQuery, making sure that jQuery is running on the page and then the script that I wrote. And then I just took all those three files and uh, put them in a folder, zipped that up and um, uploaded it to Chrome and uh, just installed it locally on my computer. And um, I'm gonna show you the results now. So what the browser extension does is remove all those obstacles that I uh, previously identified that contribute to the user's cognitive load. So before with link out or outside tool, you'd have to um, first remember to use the library specific URL. Then when you do your search, you'd have to click on abstract view. Uh, the screenshot on the right here is just the default summary view with no links to content. So you don't know what's available, what's not, what's going on. And then it inserts um, a big clear button that links out to our link resolver. So that button, is consistently located at the bottom of the main content of every record. So every article, every record of every article in every view, whether it's summary view or abstract view right here, it's gonna be consistently located. There's only gonna be one button, so the user is not gonna be choosing between different things. Since it links out to our link resolver, they don't have to worry about authentication and paywalls, et cetera. Um, it's consistent with our branding. Uh, visually, the, the color and the font. And um, it reduces a lot of clutter on the page and is just always in a consistent location. And uh, that's pretty much it.
I'm not hearing anything, so I'm gonna. Uh, oh, okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you, um, Russ, I think you're a primary reader. Um, did you want to go first? Hello, Russ. I've got to unmute this first. I yeah, start yeah. talking, and I'm just talking to myself, which isn't <laughs> unusual. But um, Jill, I just was wondering. Um, have you thought about OER and how that fits into this? Um, that's a, there's a big push these days to get students to be using um, open educational resources um, rather than um, you know subscription-based sources. I, I, I don't want to overstate that, but I was just wondering if you thought much about that. Yeah, um, well, it, it's interesting. I, I think that's actually making things more confusing for our users because PubMed has PubMed Central and uh, that's uh, their open access repository. And those results get um, mixed in with subscription results. So even if a library doesn't use outside tool or link out, users can sometimes get full text access to articles if they're open access articles. It's just that the user just wants the full text article. They're not really thinking like, oh, this, I'm, I'm only getting this because it's open access. They're just thinking, oh, cool, here's a full text article that I'm clicking at. So, um, so yeah, I, I did think about that. And, I, and even though open access is, is wonderful, um, it, it's just uh, not as pervasive. And uh, especially for a lot of medical literature, uh, a library subscribed to some pretty expensive uh, uh, journals. So we want to make sure our users can get the articles from those journals if we're subscribing to them and uh, linking to our link resolver is a way to, to route that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that was it. I actually wanted to show, uh, I don't know if you, I, I know Eve may be bringing this up, but um, there's also a principle called Fitz Law. Are you aware of that? It's, um, it's uh, the time required to move to a target is a function of the target size and the distance to the target. Yeah, I, I think I came across that when I was uh, doing doing the research here, um, but uh, I, I don't know if I, I don't think I actually incorporated that specifically into um, my thesis. Well, um, I think more importantly than um, Fitz law in this particular case is that she, what she's tackling is Hicks law. Right. Which is the number of options leading to confusion on the user. So, um, if any like Fitz Law would help, but since this is not a key time, isn't really as of, of the essence in terms of them accessing the option. It's more of making sure they choose the correct option of all the options available. So I think um, going through Hicks Law. Um, we can, um, I think that would be a better approach in this particular case. Yeah, and that was why I wanted to kind of eliminate all those, uh, all those extraneous links. Like uh, on this last slide, I, uh, I can't really make it bigger now, but there's like I think something on this particular record, like eight possible links someone could click to get to the full text article. And uh, first of all, they might not all actually link to the full text article. So it's, it's it's a lot to choose from, and it's it's kind of silly that there's so many options to choose from. When if a library offers a link resolver that will always correctly route to the full text article, that should be the only thing that will appear. Right. I mean, I think this is a brilliant use of uh, an add-on to create a make something so much more functional. I think it's brilliant. Great job. Thank you. Um, the again, um, Hicks Law. Uh, um, I, I, did you have any? Um, did, were you just going with the blue color because it matched your school colors, or is there any did any thought process go into the actual design of your button? Yeah. So the the color I. The color is uh, it's consistent with our university's branding, but they're uh, in our branding. Um, just because I, I, I'm somewhat involved with our website, um, and there, you know, there are rules. You know, use 
this, this, and this color only. And that's, and that's the, the, the blue that we use. But there's also um, like kind of a maroonish color that we use. And I was going back and forth thinking maybe the maroonish would stand out better and kind of draw the user's eye more. So that was, that was something that I went back and forth on. Anyone else have any questions? Uh, it's um, fairly straightforward for me. And, and the only reason I brought up uh, uh, Fitz Law was just, uh, you, you may want to just, uh, you know, add that to your just sort of basic knowledge base on your own. Because, you know, the idea is that we look at certain places, you know, and we take action based on that. And you just want to keep that in mind. Um, otherwise, we could even if there are fewer choices, we may not see it because right. we don't look there. But, but, and there's other design principles like uh, entry point where, you know, you're always looking for, and you could do that, which is something you could mention in terms of where surveys would take you. And I think you've talked about that, you know, the idea of basically just testing it and see if it works, you know, and see if people are finding their, um, the full text of articles. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm hoping to introduce it to our faculty this summer and then in with introducing it to the students in the fall, hopefully having, you know, making making it available in Chrome and, um, you know, now, marketing it somehow. Is there any, um, um, not that you need it for your dissertation um, or your thesis, but are you going to potentially collect any data about its use? Um, I think that would probably be a really good idea. I haven't thought that far in advance, but I, I should be. <laughs> um, I mean, if you do, it could lead to some publications further down the line. And it would, I think, be really interesting to collect, you know, if you could do a before and after comparison of introducing it and how much time and or how many, how effective people's searches are before and after the tool, that could lead to uh, a really you know, influential paper. Yeah, that, yeah, thank you. That's something I would, I, I am now going to look into. You know, I just wanted to say, this is Steve. I thought that was a really nice project. So thank you for doing thank it. Thank you. I love, see, I love to see people do, our students get involved in, in that level of work and kind of do both the coding and the design together. So that's really nice to see. Thank you. Well, luckily, the co if the coding were any more um, complicated, I would have not have not have been able to do it. So yeah, sure you would have. But yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, congratulations, Jill. That you did a really great job explaining this. Thank you. Good. Well, I think we're ready to wrap this up. I don't think there are any more.